Okay, hello everyone. I think that it's time to get it started. You've been waiting for it, I think, like one year or so. At least we've been. It's my pleasure as one of the organizers to welcome you to the third edition of Wroclaw I I hope you are okay and you are gonna enjoy this show. So, one more info. So this conference was done by guys who are wearing these white badges. Um, you can go to them with a problem you have, and you can thank them if you think that we are doing good job. OK, so now I'm going to back off a little from my role as an organizer and jump into the suit of the speaker. So then I can go back again to be just the organizer and have a lot of things to worry about. But right now, let's just focus on the talk. So today I'm going to talk to you about developers-oriented project management, as you see. My name is Robert Pankowski, and I work in Arkansas, and I like helping people. And today I would like to help you with the process that you have around creating software in your company. And <laughs> you might be wondering why even give such talk? What was the reason? What motivated me to start talking about the subject? And we have an interesting story where usually customers come to us with the idea that we should help them doing some software project and the responsibility of doing the technical are on us. And we just work as R can see. But some time ago, we had an interesting situation in which customer came to us and wanted not only us to do uh, the product, to work on the software, but also to join the team of programmers that he already had working on his startup. And we took the project, and that made me realize what were the differences, a lot of differences between the way we have our project done compared to the way the, our customer was doing things. And the initial way in our customer was like, there was one person responsible for merging pull requests and one person doing manually the deploys. So you can probably imagine where we were compared to our customer. And that made me realize uh, a lot of things that we are doing differently in my company that make me a happier person. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the techniques that I think we are using that make me a more happier and less stressed programmer. So. <laughs> The agenda is that I'm going to tell you about small stories, about letting them be unassigned, um, about taking them as part of your daily job, and how to deal with big features when we like small features. And But customers usually come to us with big features. So let's start it. So the first technique that I'm going to tell you about is about story of size one. And it's a very simple idea. It's just that instead of trying to um, come up with um, some estimation for the size of the stories, just break the stories until they are, they are of size one, meaning they have like about four hours of work to do, um, maximum like two days, and the story must bring a value for anyone any stakeholder in your project. So that might be you as a programmer, that might be user of your software, that might be customer itself, maybe sales, maybe marketing, maybe administration, anyone. You must bring any value to anyone that you are working with in the project. But the story must also be undivisible, meaning that if you can break the story into two smaller ones, and each one of them is still bringing business value, then just go ahead and break them. And I really like working with small stories, um, which does, you can just take them from, from the backlog and just do them, finish them, move as done, and start thinking about it. And compare that to one week story, when you take a story and you work, you work about it for like one week over and over, and over again, and at the end of the day, you still have this feeling in your head that the story is just not finished, you have the mental overhead that the story is not delivered. And working on big stories, like one week or even bigger, because I know companies who assign to you 
three weeks long stories, that's just leading to alienation and stress because um, if we are working on one part of the code for like one week and another programmer is working for another part of the, the uh, for another feature somewhere else for one week, then we've just got no reason to communicate with each other. We can just, you know, go do our things and we don't have that much to talk about. And it's also stressful for us, for programmers, and it's stressful for managers um, because we can just say that the story is either done or not done. If, he's, if someone asks us in the middle of like two week story, what's the status, we need to go into great details to explain what's been done and what's not been done. So there are a lot of benefits for working with small stories. It's easier to track progress because when someone looks at a high level overview of your backlog, um, like in Pivotal or Trello, then we can just see what's been done recently and what people are working on. You don't need to just go into the, um, the particular story to see like some checklist to see what's been done, what's not. You just look and at, at the first look you see what's going on. And the other important thing that I really like is the closure. The fact that whenever we are done, every four hours, whenever you finish the story, you just take the story and move it from the backlog to the done. And that is refreshing and re rewarding. That's your ritual that gives you closure. And closure is a real psychological thing that scientific, scientifically proved that we need to have a closure for things that we work. We need to make sure that something is either done or not done, that we can stop thinking about it. And the act, the ritual or marking small task is done frees our mind. But the most important task, the most important benefit that I really, really like is the collective ownership. We, when we have small stories, it's way easier for programmers to come work in different parts of the system. It's not like anymore I'm working one week over this thing or that thing. It does, I can go be here for four hours, then take a next ticket from this part, and then here and here. And people, the ability to work on different parts of the project. And it happens when more, when, when more, way more And, whew, can you hear me? Or, yeah, that's cool. And, yeah, because you don't learn anything by reading your own code. You only learn by reading someone else's code and trying to figure out whether the code is uh, actually working the way the specification says, whether the code is revealing its intention or whether it's not. And nobody's gonna learn anything about the value of your tests if someone doesn't come to your module trying to implement new feature to see whether the tests are still passing or not. Or when someone does refactoring, whether your tests are good enough to allow me the refactoring and still have a proof that the behavior is the same. And if you are an owner of agency, the small stories make you make people in your company way more mobile across different projects that your company has. Because um, it's way more likely that if the project that I'm working on, when the project is stagnated for a day or two because customer is not delivering new requirements, it's way easier for me to jump into a different project and like help you with something, boost the velocity of that project with doing a small four hour task, then it's not possible compared to the situation in which you can, you can try to do something in a different project, but the tasks are like one week long. You won't even bother trying to start working on the task because it's just too big. And, and more benefits. Um, because small stories minimize the risk of not delivering. And it happens because if something bad happens to me in the middle of four hour tasks, in worst case, we can even drop this task and have someone completely else take this task and start doing this thing. And when I'm in the middle of something like two weeks long and I'm getting sick or um, I have pers personal offers to attend, then it's way harder for someone to take um, the half-baked code from me. And that's a real thing. And in the spirit of agile, small stories, small stories allow us to deliver features more gradually. Like instead of doing and pushing this big thing in production after a month of job uh, with 20 migrations, which are more likely to blow up your database and whatever, 
Uh, we just work over small things that are pushed and delivered daily, and we can monitor whether something bad is happening or not. And we can have the feedback from the code, from the stakeholders, from the owners, from users, way, way more easily. And the third thing is that small stories allow your customer to prioritize better with a bigger granularity. Because um, instead of just saying that you, you need to do this big task A and then the big task B, the customer can cherry pick the specific small stories from feature A and then maybe some from feature B that deliver the biggest value. And then we can come back to the less important things from feature A and then something from feature B. And I have one example for you. So that was done in three weeks, like 35 stories, and every day we delivered once or twice. And that was like four pages of the documentation, one diagram with a lot of corner cases showing what should be where and some UI design. And that's one of the best examples. Two developers work over that through three weeks and push day by day by day. That was a cool experience of something, of working on something. And at any given time, if the customer decided to go with something else, with a bigger feature, new opportunity for startup, we could just drop it as it was deployed. Everything that we did would be working, nothing would be broken, all the features would still deliver some value to someone. It just some cases wouldn't be implemented as described in the documentation because we were able at every time to find that are going to make the entire feature happen at some time. So the second thing that I'm going to talk to you about is leaving tasks unassigned. And you might be like, why? Why would anyone do that, Robert? What's the matter with you? And the idea is very simple. We have like three developers with 10 tasks, and they, they were assigned. And the idea is that at any given moment, the developer should be working on the most important tasks for our customer. I think you agree that's the right thing to you, to us, to, to be working on the most important thing. And, but it, we don't live in a like Hollywood-directed movie. We live in reality. And in reality, some tasks stay longer, and sometimes some tasks stay shorter than we anticipated. And this developer number one and two uh, at some points are working on tasks which are not the most important. At, at the end of the iteration, we can have task like number eight and nine done, but not task number seven, which is clearly more important to the client. And that's not something that we want. And with unassigned tickets, uh, people can just take the tickets that are most important and, and start doing them. So the un unassigned tickets give us freedom and elasticity. They allow us to manage the risk that creating a software is. The positive risk, some people sometimes are more effective, the code is better than we expected, and things get in shorter time. And the bad risk, people get sick or have personal things to do. It, it gives us the elasticity, which is very important for us because we, we try to work, we all at our currency work remotely, and we try to work asynchronously, and unassigned tasks are a very big part of that. We don't need to like synchronize that much. We, we can just take the task. And I'm going to talk about it later as well. So now let me talk a little bit for you about what happens when a project manager assigns tasks, because I have a really big problem with that. So in one project that I joined, the project manager asked me, what are you good at? Because she wanted to know what task to assign to me. And you know, that's a very tricky question because if I answer that I'm a good backend developer, which I supposedly am, then does that mean that I should not working on front end? Should I not be working on like this Ember stuff or Angular, HTML or CSS? I can do all that things. I like doing that. So should I for one next year be working on the backend just because I'm so-called backend developer? I don't think so. And the big problem with product managers is that they tend to assign you tasks uh, in the areas of code that you worked previously. If I take like 
task from financial module, then next time there is a task from financial module, the product manager thinks that, well, you already work there, assign you again, and then I'm slowly becoming someone owning that part of code, because when there's third task in the financial module, now the product manager has reasons to pick me to work on this part of the code. And I don't like that. And let's talk what happens when developers assign tasks to themselves. Then there is a different problem, I think. Because, you know, no matter what product you work on, there are cool tasks that are the tasks that are exciting, that are interesting. And, and there are tasks which might probably be mundane or related to part of the code that some developer who was not writing a good code and already left your company, that he created this part of the code and no one enjoys working there. And you must realize that over the time, people in your project gained a different amount of power. And when developers assign tasks to themselves, the problem might be the person, the people with the lowest power, power in your project, they will not be able to any time take the most interesting task. The most interesting task will be taken by your like super ninja developers or whoever acquired power in your team. And the junior developers or whoever is lower uh, on your ladder will be able to take the uninteresting mundane tasks. And in both cases, uh, you must add, ask yourself, where is your collective ownership? Am I really working on different parts of the system or is it like um, all the time working on the same part? I'm always over and over and over assigned to the same part of the code. Because with small and unassigned tasks, it's way easier for people to jump to different parts of the code. And I want to ask yourself, I want to you to ask yourselves one more question. Is it clear to you when you come to your work after vacations or after weekend what you should be working on? Um, do you know what's most important for your client? And if it's not, can you figure it out yourself or do you need to contact someone? Because if you try to embrace asynchronous work and you need to go to someone, to a product manager and ask them what should I be working on, and you have a problem if you would like to start working at 6 a.m. and your product manager works since 10 a.m. because you've got four hours and you have no idea uh, what to work on. In our company, in our situation, the whole communication with the client is visible to everyone in our team. And even if I don't immediately know what to do, I can still look through all the conversations and documentation of telephone calls and I can figure out the priorities myself, so I don't need to wait for anyone to tell me what to work on. If I see that something is not good in the backlog, I can look at the communication and fix it. And because of all the problems that happen when tasks are assigned upfront, we came up with the third route, which just said, says, take the first task from the prioritized backlog. You have backlog, the most important tasks are, the, are at the top, the least important at, are at the bottom. You come up in the morning, you look at the backlog, you take the first task and you start working on that. It's as simple as that. And surprisingly, the fact that you take the task doesn't mean that you need to finish it. Because if you are not so good, if you are not familiar with that technology, if you worry that you are not gonna finish it on time, you can just try to sandbox this task and do as much as possible, like for example, in one hour. And then you take this task, in our example, it's usually related to managing the infrastructure with traffic related tools. And you can take it and try to add the new feature, new requirement, and whatever goes wrong, whatever you don't know, whatever obstacles are they that prevents you from finishing this task, that write it down and Maybe you will finish this task in one hour, or maybe you won't. But if you don't, at the end, the next person that is probably better at this task, when the person takes it, can see or, and look at all the things that were problematic to you, that, that went wrong. And this person can see like, be like, you know, this was a problem. Maybe I should record a screencast or like give this person a link or recommend a book that is going to help next time there is similar task. 
and you don't need to assign all the tasks. I mean, you don't need to leave all the tasks unassigned. It's okay to assign some tasks. Let's say that you have like mm, the someone who's working with sales and doing the graphic design for marketing, for paper printed ads, someone who's good at Photoshop, and maybe this person is also good at HTML and CSS and all that stuff. And no one else, if no one else in your team wants to be good uh, at Photoshop and learn something, you can just go ahead and assign all the tasks to this person. But you need to be very good and very clear, clear with communication with this person because this person needs to know which time should it take the unassigned task from the prioritized backlog and which time this person should be working on tasks assigned to that person. And at the end, it's, it's really hard, but it's possible. And you need to be aware of the needs of that developer. If you've got so much stuff related to Photoshop, uh, this person would like to work on other parts of the system, not just do pretty images uh, for the newspapers, then um, this person at some time might get bored because only this person is assigned, assigned, assigned to tasks related to creating pretty graphics. Um, so maybe in that case, you would like to have developers working 50% of the time on graphic things and 50% of the time on like front-end related things uh, so that they don't burn out, so that they are still interested in working in your project. And so we like small stories unassigned so that everyone can take it from the backlog. But how do we come up there when customers usually come to us with big features that they would like to have? And there are two ways. The first way is to extract the small task upfront. So this is good if you have like one week tasks and instead of making a big story about it, you just upfront can see all the small steps leading to realizing to building this, this feature. So we upfront create like five or seven one size tasks and that's okay. But that's not gonna work if you have even bigger tasks like three weeks long, like I showed you in the example. And in that case, we came up with the idea of specification as floating ticket. So you have a specification as ticket in your backlog and as part of the take the first task, someone is reaching that specification but instead of just opening and implementing, starting to implement a really big story, this person is now responsible for putting product manager hat on and trying to extract small stories from that specification. So you see the current state of the specification, what's been done, what's not been done, what's working, what's not working. And you try to extract one, two, or maybe three small steps from the specification and and to find out next thing that can be done to make this feature uh, finished. And when you're done with that, when you extract like two tasks from that specification, you just move it lower in the backlog. So uh, sometime later, someone else is going to reach it and start mining, extracting new tasks from it. And when you're done, you just leave your product manager hat off you are again a developer and you start working on the extracted tasks from the specification as part of your take the first task rule. So I told you about the four techniques and all that I told you was under the assumption that your team actually wants to learn, improve and grow. And I think that's a pretty good assumption considering that you are at our conference. But in our case, it's like we have two or five people working on a project with the customer and the people have different skill sets. Some of them are good at backend, some at front end, some like this thing, some like to manage our infrastructure. But we, all of us, try to get better in things that we don't yet excel in. So we try to get better in every area. So that's, that's our workflow. That's what we try to do. And the summarize is that I told you about four techniques. I told you that we like small stories, unassigned, take the first task, and if you get something big, just use specification as floating ticket to, to deal with that. And you can use every one of that technique separately. Every one of it is giving you value. Everyone is 
every every of this rule is giving you something nice, but they work best and give you most benefits when you apply all of them. And in that case, they give you collective ownership. When you have small stories unassigned, it's way easier for developers to jump across the project to work on different features instead of just working over and over on the same thing. You are more asynchronous because you embrace this way of communication. We are backlog. We try to you know, call a product manager and try to figure out what to work on. That should be always the first thing in the backlog and that's the responsibility of product owner to prioritize it. And you quit the self-reinforcing loop that is making you work over and over and over on the sam same parts of codes just because you told at the first meeting that you are a backend developer. And we try at the same time deliver business value. So we try to get the feature done, but we try to learn at our work. And that won't eliminate the learning at home, but home is supposed to be a place for our family when we rest, when we take care of our hobby. And the other place that we can learn at is the work. But I won't learn anything if you assign to me one week long story related to front end in JavaScript because that's gonna scare me. I'm not that good. But if you gave me a small task, like four hours, then I'm gonna take it and in worst case, it's gonna take me eight hours because I'm not a professional front end developer. But I will just get better and better because you let me work on that parts that I don't know yet. And if that got you interested, I wrote a book about it. And you can go there to the link that I'm showing you and sign up to the newsletter and you will receive the another techniques that I'm gonna tell you about. And if I just sold you because I was that good, you can just buy the book with 25% discount and the coupon code. And I think that's it, Roslav. Thank you for letting me speak uh, as a first speaker and welcome to the conference. Thank you. Do you have any questions? And if do, ask them loudly. Usually people don't have, and they ask me um, privately. Yep. Um, sorry that I didn't see you, but I'm kind of blind because of the lights. I think it's you, right? Yeah. I think that could be a problem to extract uh, small stories that are independent. I mean that. Uh, uh, when yeah. you extract some stories, uh, you have to do it uh, them in uh, some order. It yeah, happens it happens very often, and the way we deal with it is that we try to interlap the stories from different uh, features. I don't have the uh, like brilliant solution for that problem. We just try to like extract few stories and then then interlap them with stories from other features. And if you have like two features that are, you are working on and three developers, then because of mathematics and division, they will sometimes take tasks from one module and sometimes from another. But I agree that it's sometimes problematic that there are dependencies between the stories. But in uh, tools like Pivotal, you can easily see epics and you can see whether the person who were working on another stories uh, related to the same feature, to the same epic is finished. And if not, you can just either skip this task for now because other thing is not finished or you can still take it and start doing because it's possible for you guys to work together um, but now you have a very good information and you know that you need to communicate with that person because this person is working on similar part of the code so that's kind of my answer there was someone there I think yeah <laughs> do you hear me yeah, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> My question is, uh, how much time do you spend on like dividing this uh, big task into these smaller tasks? How much time is it? Like, let's say like this one one week task. Uh, how much time do you spend on on like extracting it to the smaller tasks? Um, I don't count it. I'm not really sure how much time I spend. Not that much, because I when I have a big story and that happens, I 
even if I don't do it like officially, that I you know extract smaller tasks and things like that. When I'm working on something big, I'm doing it anyway. I'm still trying to to make smaller tasks from it and deploy them earlier to production, make sure nothing is breaking, and find small steps that are leading to creating something big. So even if I don't do it like officially, internally, I'm still using that as part of my technique. It's like I'm really way more safe with deploying 40 line change than 400 line change. I like very much the smaller commits, smaller deploys. I just I try to achieve big things by doing small small things. Yep. Uh, hi. So you mentioned at the beginning that you were working as a part of a bigger team. So uh, how hard was it to convince the uh, other team to do things just your way? Because I assume they had. Their how hard was it to do what? To convince them to do things your way. Because I assume they had the product. product, product. Well, they came. Uh, to us to actually learn our way, they were satisfied and happy, I mean, or maybe the right word is impressed with things that we were blogging about. Um, so they actually already kind of wanted to learn more from us, so it wasn't that much hard to convince. Um, I think the most convincing way is when you um, are trying to convince the developers, I'm trying to just do my job best uh, in front of the product owner. If the product owner comes to me with like three weeks story, like I showed you, and instead of like doing it for three weeks and I deliver every every day and I can show something new, then the product owner is happy with that and is think that this model works for him and it's beneficial. That even if like I'm not going today to the work because I'm in the dentist, another person from my team can take and replace me and still do something, push the, the feature and do do something uh, small. And then the product owner like that, they see that it's working and I'm trying to do this with them. Um, and the, I just try to be a good example. And the other developers can either like it, take it, take from it and learn it, or they can ignore it. It's their choice. Yeah, last row I think. How do you measure if that works? Do you have any statistics about the uh, happiness of your clients? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think it's a better question for my boss. I, it's like, it's very subjective something. You talk with the client and uh, you see whether they are happy or not. And I don't try to measure it. Like when I'm done with talking with client, I don't give like, oh, that talk was like four stars. Let's try to measure it. I, I don't do that. So I don't. I think the one way to measure it is whether they, they, are, they are willing to give uh, you better rates. If they are happy, they will be more likely to, to have higher rates. They should be rising uh, in time when you are working with that client, assuming you don't screw up other things. Someone is talking to me, I don't know who or where. Yeah? If I adopt your awesome method, do I need my project manager? Can I fire my product manager? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can still have your product manager. Uh, our customers have product managers. Um, but half of the book, my book, is about how you can go in your team without product manager. So your, your programmers are collecting uh, managing your code base and our idea is that programmers can also collectively manage the, the requirements, the features. So instead, uh, you don't have like one uh, programmer doing all the things, you have five people and you can have the same five people doing the product manager job. So, and I'm writing a lot about uh, how the programmers can do that in the book. That's, that's how we try to do things. Okay, last question because we have other speakers. Thanks. Uh, so I would like to know, maybe I understand it wrong, but what's the difference between the Scrum and between the workflow you, you described right now? I don't know. <laughs> um, I, but I know people, you know, people label themselves like they're Agile or they're Scrum, and I start to think that the labels don't mean anything anymore. Whenever someone says that they are doing Agile Kanban, 
whatever, whatever, it doesn't mean anything anymore because when you come in real life to their product, it turns out that there's one person doing pull request mergers and one person uh, doing deploys and they claim that they're doing agile. So I'm not buying the label thing. Okay, thank you guys. Um, yeah, and who's the next speaker? That's the right question.